Hello everyone, a very warm welcome to our NPAC's 8th Human Wildlife Encounters webinar. Thank you all for joining us on Zoom and on YouTube. Uh, today's webinar is on the theme of combating illegal wildlife trade in uh, uh, Singapore. My name is Nicholas and I'll be your host for this morning. We'll be joined by our NPAC's colleagues, Ms. Xie Renhui from the Wildlife Trade Team, Dr. Hyung Kam Chu from the Center of Wildlife Forensics, and Ms. Elizabeth Clark from the World, World, Worldwide Fund for Nature Singapore. Together, they will share more about Singapore's efforts in combating illegal trade in wildlife, how science is used to analyze and uncover insights about wildlife seizures, and the importance of effective collaboration and collective efforts across governments, non-governmental organizations, and businesses. Now, after the presentations, we are having an interactive Q&A session. If you have any questions along the way, uh, you can send them as a private message to Hazelina and Parks. So that's Hazelina and Parks as a private message using the Zoom chat. And we will try to answer as many questions as we can during the Q&A. Singapore adopts a zero tolerance stance on the illegal sale or keeping of wildlife and smuggling of endangered species and their parts and derivatives. Now, as we speak, there is an ongoing public consultation on the proposed changes to the Endangered Species Import and Export Act. I hope you are as excited to hear about these efforts from our speakers as I am. So now I'll hand the time over to Renhui. So Renhui, please. Hi, good morning, everybody. So sorry that it's taken me a while to unmute myself, some technical issue here. Very good morning to everybody. I'm Renhui from uh, N Park's Wildlife Trade Division. Very happy to see many of you online on a Saturday morning to spend time with us um, this morning. So uh, I will kick off with a deck of slides to basically share with you what are some of Singapore's efforts in combating illegal trade in wildlife. So this is an outline of my presentation. So first of all, what is wildlife trade? I think very importantly to scope the presentation or the discussion is really what, what do we consider as wildlife trade? Um, it's actually part and parcel of our life, uh, in our daily life, in terms of the food that you eat, for example, wild caught fishes, you know, like sea cucumber, um, as well as it can also be uh, live animals that are kept as pets, such as arowana fish, parrots, as well as wildlife products that are traded. Uh, so I mentioned food product, and then some of your timber uh, furniture may be made of timber. There are also wooden musical instruments. Um, there are also people that buy exotic leather bags, shoes, and clothes. So you can see that it's part and parcel of uh, our daily, uh, part of daily life. And what does wildlife trade entails? It's basically the sale or exchange of animals or plants taken from wild. So effective regulating trade in wildlife product has great benefits for people especially when it's done in a sustainable way. It provides livelihoods, it, provides, it protects the ecosystem, and it provides the vital services that I've just described to you just now. And so how is international wildlife trade regulated? Okay, so there is a global treaty known as the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Flora and Flora, in short, CITES. So this is a global treaty signed on by more than 183 countries internationally, and it regulates trade by a permit system. Um, and they are the animal species that they covered, they are protected under CITES. They are actually 36,000 species, and they have different degree of protection under Appendix 1, Appendix 2, and Appendix 3. As you can see, Appendix 1 are uh, species that are threatened with extinction and international commercial trade is generally prohibited. And if you look at the percentage, it's actually a small percentage of the entire ecosystem that is being regulated by CITES. So a big chunk, which fall under Appendix 2, whereby species are not necessarily threatened with extinction, but may become so unless trade is regulated. 
So this group of uh, specimen or species are uh, trade is permitted only if it comes with the necessary documentation of a CITES permit. And then the last group of appendix three, basically the species are subject to regulations and they are uh, regulated at the request of parties. So perhaps um, may not be known to many is that in fact, every year there's 10 over million of CITES transaction reported involving 78% of fauna and 22% of flora uh, in the past decade. So it's quite a big, um, it's quite a big industry like, in that sense uh, for wildlife trade. So unfortunately, on the flip side, um, illegal wildlife trade uh, happens. This means unsustainable taking, selling of wildlife that threatens survival of endangered species globally. And this can result in the potential extinction of these species. Uh, this is often driven by financial gains targeted at species at risk that are of high value. And is often transnational in nature, involving the source transit transit and destination country. So why is it important that we should care about it? So first of all, it threatens the survival of endangered species. So you can see here, um, uh, I think the commonly known ones will be you know, the elephants that is listed under CITES Appendix 1, um, rhino, pangolin. Even in Singapore, we have our wildlife, the Sunda pangolin. It's uh, critically endangered. Uh, you see in the picture here. And there's also straw-headed boo-boo uh, that has a beautiful song. Uh, it's also critically endangered uh, here, even though we do see a healthy population growing. So another reason why we should care is really about uh, illegal wildlife trade drinks about invasive species that can contribute to habitat destruction. It harms our ecosystem and biodiversity. And with unregulated uh, and illegal wildlife trade, it evades biosecurity and sanitary controls. Uh, this actually leads to the increased risk of zoonotic diseases. So this falls nice, nicely into the vision, our vision of becoming a city in nature, uh, that we are committed to the global fight against illegal wildlife trade to basically protect our biodiversity and also to contribute to the international um, combat against illegal wildlife trade. So how do we do so? And this is why we are, uh, Singapore is a signatory to the convention, uh, CITES, since 1986. Uh, like mentioned, this is a convention that is aimed to regulate international trade to ensure that animals and plants are not threatened, um, their survivors are not threatened by the trade. And in Singapore, we put together a whole of government, multi-pronged approach to combat the illegal trade in wildlife. So I will move to the next segment of my presentation that will talk more in depth about the Singapore approach to combat illegal wildlife trade. Uh, in Singapore, like I mentioned, it's a multi-pronged approach and it covers four main areas. Uh, first of all, leg legislation and regulation, then enforcement. Uh, we, I also share about our developing capabilities and international cooperation, and finally on community stewardship. So in Singapore, we have strict laws and robust legislative framework to regulate wildlife trade. Like I mentioned, we are party of CITES, so we have a permit system. Uh, all CITES regulated specimens needs to have a CITES permit. Uh, is issued by my department. Uh, if illegal wildlife trade happens, we have strong laws, uh, strict laws to enforce against. So the penalties for illegal import-export transit is up to a fine of 50000 up to a maximum aggregate of 500,000 and or two years jail. Um, domestically, the sale and advertisement of selected society species such as tiger, rhino and elephant ivory is strictly prohibited in Singapore. This can lead to a fine of $10,000 up to a maximum aggregate sum of 100,000 and or 12 month jail. Like I mentioned, um, domestically, the sale of uh, tiger, rhino, uh, is prohibited and very recently in 1st September, we implemented the domestic ivory trade ban from 1st September 2021 onwards. This means that the sale of all elephant ivory is prohibited. The public display for sale is also prohibited. Um, so actually before the ban, um, we 
engage the industry, the the shops they are selling ivory, there are still a few handful they are selling to engage them to such that they can face over and you know shift uh, to a mode whereby they stop selling ivory. And then we continue to carry out our surveillance and monitoring, especially on online platform, working with our online e-commerce party um, to screen and to check any illegal sale or any illegal public uh, display of sale um, on in retail shop as well as on uh, e-commerce platform to ensure that the ban uh, is effectively implemented. So I move on to enforcement. Uh, mentioned earlier on, we have a whole of government approach. So NPARCs, we work very closely with Singapore Customs and Immigration and Checks Checkpoints Authority ICA to screen, to inspect our shipments at a checkpoint and to investigate any cases of uh, illegally traded wildlife. So uh, we have a risk assessment approach and then we have screening uh, at the borders to check. And because, and we also rely heavily on uh, international cooperation and intel given to us where it's credible and actionable, uh, we will take action. So this is how, uh, it resulted in a record seizure amount of pangolin skills and elephant ivory uh, over the years. And specifically in 2019, we had three seizures and it amount to a total of 8.8 .8 tons of ivory, uh, which we, which is a saddening fact that actually we calculated, I think it involves like about 300 elephants and a scary amount of 37.5 tons of pangolin scales was seized in April and July, 2019. Um, what we understand is it, prob it probably was, uh, came from about 40,000 uh, pangolins uh, in Africa. So to strengthen our enforcement approach, uh, on top of the risk assessment, the enforcement, the screening, and the intel that we get uh, at NPARCs, we have invested in resources to actually introduce and to train a group of specially trained dogs, sniffer dogs, to help us detect wildlife and wildlife uh, product at the checkpoint uh, since August 2021. So um, like I described about the 2019 seizure, so this is um, a video clip on the amount of uh, elephant tusks that we seized. Uh, it was a record haul of ivory uh, alongside with pangolin scales. Uh, total, the shipment was worth 66 million sing dollars. Um, and like I mentioned, we, the amount of pangolin scales seized uh, actually came from four different types of pangolin species uh, from Africa. Uh, in world, there are only just eight types of pangolin species. And our seizure actually, you know, comprise of four of those that came from Africa. So what happened to the ivory and pangolin scales that uh, were seized by Singapore? So uh, my colleague later will go into detail of the analysis that we do to the elephant uh, ivory, uh, but all this ivory and pangolin scales were destroyed after analysis and sampling. Um, it's quite a um, resource intensive process because as you know, ivory uh, itself is very tough. So we actually had to uh, bring about industrial in machine to crush the ivory. The crushing happened uh, last year during COVID. And we actually did a live stream on YouTube so that people from Singapore all over the world can actually view the, the crushing uh, simultaneously online and real time uh, over three days. And after the, the ivory were crushed, they were actually sent uh, for incineration. As for the pangolin scales, uh, immediately when it was seized and samples were taken, they were actually sent for incineration. So all these are recorded and documented. And it's important to note that uh, we destroy all the seized uh, specimen. Uh, it's such that because all commercial sale is not allowed and we do not want all this specimen to return to the market um, and to contribute to the illegal wildlife trade. Uh, so what we want to do here is really to disrupt the global supply chain and to stop them from returning to the market. Now, so I move to the third, third pillar, which is on developing capabilities. Uh, I think maybe some of you might be aware uh, that in August 2021, fairly recently, we opened our Center for Wildlife Forensic. Um, it basically strengthens our capabilities to identify and analyze specimens involved in eco 
in the trade, uh, illegal wildlife trade. And this is actually anchored by a panel of advisors, uh, international advisors, as well as local advisors, experts, uh, to collaborate with us on seizure analysis and forensic work. So the Center for Wildlife Forensic, uh, there is uh, the three pillars that we look into, basically number one, the genetic uh, spectrographic and the chemical analysis of our wildlife specimen, the flora part of things, and then uh, second, the wood identification, and then building up a reference library of uh, timber collection, also known as dilarium, to help us uh, in our work. And number three, on species identification and data information and collection. So I uh, mentioned about international collaboration. So on the ivory and pangolin seizures that we made, we actually work very closely with our international partners, uh, in specific, specifically uh, leading conservationists, uh, conservation biologist, Professor Samuel K. Wassler from the University of Washington to actually help us to make sense of the specimens that we have seized to find out if we can find out more information to enable us to better understand the modus operandi of the criminal network uh, at source uh, and also to enhance and strengthen our prosecution actions that we can take from leading from the seizures. So all this work that I mentioned, um, it has, uh, has been given good international recognition uh, by the CITES Secretariat. So basically our approach and enforcement measures are endorsed by CITES Secretariat. Um, and we have actually been recognized and awarded the UN Secretary, um, UN Secretary, UN Asia Environmental Enforcement Awards, specifically on the 2019 seizure that was a result of the intel provided by China, uh, where Singapore seized the record amount that I've shown earlier. And uh, more importantly, because of uh, our track record, we have been appointed as the board member in the International Wildlife Crime Working Group. So the work that we have done uh, basically um, has been recognized by, uh, you know, by the different stakeholders. And we often look forward to collaborate deeply and more with uh, our international partners uh, uh, because we really strongly believe that it cannot be just the regulator of Singapore alone fighting uh, this, solving this issue that we have. So um, this brings nicely to the next part about collaborating with partners, because apart from the international partners, we also collaborate uh, with our local partners like WWF Singapore, uh, NGOs to actually importantly to raise awareness amongst the industry, such as e-commerce platforms. Um, also working with them on the cyber spotter program that they will share about it later on. Um, and also looking into technologies to help us to you know, work out, develop tools that can address the illegal wildlife trade. So we are working with companies like Microsoft um, to look into uh, things that can help us to carry out our job, as well as uh, the businesses, uh, the industry engagement, uh, speaking to the traditional Chinese shops, shipping industry, um, and also the e-commerce platform because they are all part and parcel along the supply chain and they are the people that we engage. So the pictures you see here are uh, basically the webinars that we have um, organized. And during non-COVID time where we have a big exhibition uh, during Festival of uh, Biodiversity, we also bring this down to the heartland uh, to, you know, get, uh, to increase awareness to the general public on uh, illegal wildlife trade and what they can do about it. We go down to the fishery port uh, to talk to the merchants at the fishery port about landing of regulated species uh, and the necessary documents required. So community support is also key. Uh, so this is where the public can also help uh, by ensuring and not buying any wildlife animals that are illegally obtained or imported. Um, and also when you're buying, make sure you do make informed choices. Uh, do not buy items that contain uh, endangered species. Uh, check uh, for any documentation or CITES permit to make sure that the trade uh, is legal. To contact MPAX if you spot any occurrences of uh, illegal wildlife trade, uh, illegal sale of, you know, for example, elephant ivory, um, 
And you can also be our ambassador to contribute to the fight. Uh, you can volunteer your time with us and also to run public uh, awareness events with us as well. So if you're interested, you can scan the QR code and join us in this fight against illegal wildlife tree. And Nicholas brought, spoke about it uh, briefly just now. Um, as part of our review of our law, we are actually in the process of updating the Endangered Species Import and Export Act. Um, this is to make sure that our act ensures uh, it, is, it remains effective. Um, at the beginning, we have engaged a wide range of stakeholders, um, you know, our traders, uh, NGOs, academic experts, uh, to shape the proposed amendments that you see in the picture here. Uh, they broadly fall into three categories of uh, introducing stiffer penalties for illegal trade species protected under CITES. Number two, stronger enforcement powers for end parks to get tackle illegal trade. And number three, to have more clarity for our stakeholders on the scope of Singapore wildlife trade regulations. I won't go into the detail because the details are actually available on our website and, um, and you can look through it and provide further uh, comments and views about the proposed amendments. Um, so like I mentioned, the public consultation opened on 12 November to 12 December. You can find out more about proposed amendments on our website at geogov.gov.sg slash ESA. We also have got uh, informational, information banners that are moving through uh, the various green spaces. So this weekend is actually at Songhai Bulo Visitor Centre. Do check them out. And do give us your feedback on our proposed amendments uh, of the Endangered Species Act. So with that, uh, I've come to the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. Uh, I will pass the time over to Kam Chu, who will share a bit more on you know, using science to gain deeper insights about wildlife seizure. Kam Chu, over to you. Thank you, Rong Hui, for the interesting uh, presentation. Hi, I'm Kam Chu uh, from the Center for Wildlife Forensics. Uh, today, I'm going to give uh, a short little uh, presentation regarding the seizures that we obtained in 2019 uh, on the ivories, elephant ivories. So uh, the title of my presentation is Using Science to Gain Deeper Insights About Wildlife Seizures. Sorry, give me a moment. Right, the outline of the presentation is as follows. Um, first of all, I'll tell you uh, when we first receive the seizure, well, how do we actually process them uh, from the field and then bring it back to the laboratory? And then I'll tell you some of the challenges that involve when working with elephant ivory. And uh, how do we actually overcome all these, uh, these uh, technical problems uh, by using science and technology to study them? And finally, getting all the results. And how do we actually translate them into something that's useful for the law enforcement? Right, so this is the uh, uh, a picture uh, on the picture on the left. Okay, it's uh, showing um, the, some of the libraries that we receive. So basically, uh, elephant ivories, when we first receive them, they are all randomized and they come in various shapes, uh, various sizes, colors, and even markings. So it's important for us when we first start off is to find an open space where we can actually lay down all these, all these uh, ivory on the floor so that we can sort them accordingly. So what I meant by sorting is that you uh, bring them to uh, sort them according to the size. Next, because they are all um, uh, laid on the floor, it's easier for us to pair them. So uh, as you can see on the picture on the left, uh, these are the paired ivories. And then we'll take a piece of this ivory to sample it using an electric saw. So most of you all will, under, will um, ask, why do we need to do this pairing? See, so the first, okay, actually the pairing gives us a lot of information is that the task 
okay, if you once you are able to pair them, you know that this task belongs to the same elephant. Well, the second thing is you can actually estimate how many elephants are there in one container. And if you are able to find only one task, unable to find the other one, then it gives you an inf the information that, oh, the other task could be in other shipments. And that's where you can actually prompt your uh, uh, other agencies okay, to uh, look out in their shipments. Okay, this also tell you, give you information um, that when the elephant is killed, okay, these uh, tasks are taken and they can be sold to different brokers in the source country. And finally, as uh, Renhui mentioned earlier, that uh, this is actually a resource intensive uh, work. We want to prevent duplication. So we actually sample just one piece of the task. So what we have uh, uh, do use the electric saw to uh, drill out a sample. This looks. This is the uh, example of the ivory chips that will be sent to the laboratory for analysis. Right. Uh, each of these uh, square blocks measures about three by three cm, and then uh, when we bring this to the laboratory, we will actually start processing them for molecular analysis. But of course, working with ivory is not so simple. It's unlike uh, soft tissues where you can just uh, uh, get the DNA easily. These samples are actually very, very hard. And you cannot just use a hammer to uh, uh, hammer them and get them into powder. So you have to use some uh, equipment to uh, break them down. And also, these are highly calcified samples, which means to say you have very little DNA in them. And we have to do some pre treatment in order to extract the DNA effectively. So in the laboratory, we actually do some sample preparation okay, and uh, pre-treatment. So a picture on your left shows uh, we use this equipment called the freezer mill, which uses liquid nitrogen to help to pulverize the samples into powder. And then because you're using liquid nitrogen, you also prevent DNA degradation. Now, once we receive the powder, we also have to do treatment because as I mentioned to you, they're highly calcified. So we need to use some chemical treatment to release this DNA so that it's easier for us to do extraction. Once we have done this pre-treatment, we'll send this sample using, uh, send this sample into an automated nucleic acid extractor to extract the DNA. The usage of uh, automated nucleic acid, uh, nucleic acid extractor is useful because it prevents human contamination and also increases the throughput. So once we receive this DNA, after some uh, uh, runs, okay, we will uh, have to do some uh, quantification so that we know how to use this DNA that we obtain for subsequent experiments. Okay, with the DNA, we will proceed on to do a DNA PCR amplification. So this part of the experiment is to uh, use some primers to do to amplify a fragment of the DNA so that we can uh, uh, get a band and then we do further analysis. So in this picture on the right, it actually shows that uh, it's successful, the, the reaction is successful, and we are able to use uh, this piece of information to proceed on to the next step. Now we'll proceed to do sequencing where we will actually try, try to uh, find out what are the nucleotide bases that involve. Now, as you may know, DNA is comprises of uh, the four major bases, the ATCG, and this sequencer does this job of getting the individual ATCGs from a specimen. And with all this data, we can actually put them into the publicly available database to compare and to find out what is the species available. So in this example, it shows the uh, scientific name, Doxodonta africana, which is actually African savanna elephant. So with this piece of information, we are very certain that, oh, the sample that we work with is indeed elephant ivory. However, knowing the animal species is not good enough. 
This is because we still need to know where did this ivory come from. And knowing this information will allow the source country to focus on their enforcement in those areas. But when we want to uh, get this information, we cannot just simply just do a normal PCR like previous. We have to use another technique uh, called a short tandem repeat. So short tandem repeats analysis, okay, STR for short, can have different names. People will, can call this uh, microsatellites, or they can also call this simple sequence repeat. So what is STR? STR is actually a repetitive unit of two to six spaces, right? So in this example, I'm showing you like, for example, uh, there's a two base pair repeat where you have a TG, TG, and TG. If it's a four base pair repeat, you in this example would be a TCAG, TCAG, TCAG. And for six PP repeat, it's as follows. So what it means is that in this three example, it's just a repetitive units of three times, is repeated three times. And different individuals can have different number of repeats. So why is this important? Well, that's because each individual will have a unique STR profile. And for, uh, for elephants, we are using 16 STR markers to do the analysis. With this STR, it's like a fingerprint of the individual, and we are able to uh, use this information to find out uh, where will this elephant come from. Now, this is an example of the 16 STR markers, uh, where the uh, is uh, labeled with uh, all the different numbers on top, with representing one marker. And the power of using STR is that some of these markers are able to differentiate the uh, types of elephant, whether it's uh, the forest elephant or it can show uh, the savanna elephant, just based on the number of repeats. And when we do all this analysis, we'll gather them together and then we'll put them into uh, some databases where they are where we have reference uh, information to know where this information, this uh, animal come from. So for example, based on this, we are able to see that in Singapore, uh, the seizure made in Singapore in 2002 and 2007, it comes from the area called Zambia. And for Hong Kong 2006 and Malaysia 2012 seizure, the elephant ivory actually comes from Gabon. So with all these results that we obtain in the laboratory, we are able to know the following information. We can actually find out the familiar relationships, means to find whether these are relatives or siblings. We can also make some genotypic uh, matching in separate seizures in case uh, one can be found uh, in what uh, you can find in one but not the other, and you can match them. We can also use this information to understand how the criminal criminal network works uh, from the poaching site to the brokers of buy, to buying the tasks and stocking, uh, stockpiling them and shipping them out. And finally, you use this information to connect the multiple ivory cartels. So all of these are important because it provides the information for law enforcement and prosecution across various agencies and international partners for us to work together to counter illegal wildlife trade. So with this, I will end my presentation and uh, uh, I'll pass the time to Elizabeth from WWF Singapore with the next part of the talk. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. And a really, really interesting presentation. Honestly, it's incredibly impressive to see that um, in parks in Singapore has built this capability. Um, so that's such an interesting talk. Thank you. And, and thank you to Ben Parks for inviting WF Singapore uh, to speak at this webinar and share on our reflections on the illegal bubble of trade and the role that all stakeholders in Singapore can play and are playing uh, to tackle it. 
Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with WWF Singapore, we are part of the WWF Network, which is one of the world's largest and most experienced independent conservation organizations. And we have a mission to conserve nature and reduce the most pressing threats to diversity of, of life on Earth. And um, next slide, please. Uh, and one of those key threats is wildlife crime and illegal wildlife trade. So I'd like to start my presentation by explaining a little bit about why WWF and regionally and locally WWF Singapore uh, sees tackling illegal wildlife trade as a priority issue. Next slide, please. Um, so put simply, Stamping out wildlife crime and illegal wildlife trade is a priority because it's the largest direct threat to the future of many of the world's most threatened species. And uh, in fact, in terms of overall threats to global biodiversity, it's second only to habitat destruction. And why is this? Well, we've, we've already heard in the previous presentations that uh, many species have been ascribed a commercial value with high worldwide demand uh, for a range of reasons. It might be for uh, products including foods, medicines, pets, ornaments, uh, fashion, cultural items. And, you know, we're approaching 8 billion humans on Earth. In comparison, we have less than 4,000 tigers. So you can do the math. Uh, it only takes a tiny percentage of the human population uh, demanding um, products from, from species like the tiger uh, to drive that species to, to extinction. And the actors involved um, globally in the trade are diverse. Um, they range from the poor who rely on it to supplement their income, especially in times of hardship, um, right up to large-scale businesses and affluent city dwellers. Uh, to the extent that illegal wildlife trade represents a multi-billion dollar industry that involves organized crime groups. And hence, it actually makes it the world's fourth most lucrative crime with an estimated value of some 23 billion uh, a year. Next slide, please. So um, if we look at it, there are a range of problems that stem from illegal wildlife trade. There is the obvious and heartbreaking decline in wildlife populations, um, and dramatically so. WWF's Living Planet report reveals a two-thirds decline in wildlife populations on average since 1970. That's an enormous decline in wildlife populations. And here in Southeast Asia, um, it has been one of the key factors in a drastic decline in the populations of many wildlife species, to the extent that they are being classified as rare, endangered, or even locally extinct, from tiger to Asian elephant to pangolins. And further declines of wildlife populations also impacts upon ecosystem health, which we already heard from Renway about, um, and thus the ecosystem services and natural assets that we rely upon for our own survival. So at a localized level, um, many of the species that are declining are actually used to support subsistence needs, um, for example, for food and medicine, as well as providing a source of income. And that is being heavily impacted by the global trade. It also won't have escaped anyone's attention that we are in the midst of a pandemic. And uh, there is compelling evidence that COVID-19 is a zoonotic disease that has spilled over from wildlife to humans. And illegal wildlife trade is a direct driver um, to the spread of zoonotic disease. Uh, because it increases human wildlife interaction. And uh, I mentioned wildlife crime. Well, uh, this is a large risk to regional and to national peace and security. And at the local level, the breakdown in the rule of law exacerbates local conflict and undermines local livelihoods. So there are very serious and wide reaching impacts from illegal wildlife trade. Next slide, please. Uh, so I'll now go on to talk a little bit about the role of Singapore in illegal wildlife trade. Next slide. So Singapore is a major transit hub uh, because of our geographic location and our prowess of transport to logistics and transshipment. Um, and this includes for many species and products that are traded internationally. Uh, these can enter Singapore from source countries in Southeast Asia and Africa, and in turn are then shipped out to large consumer markets such as China, and, and Europe. And we've already heard about that enormous um, ivory seizure uh, by end parks um, and pangolin scale seizure. Um, just goes to show the sort of iceberg about the kind of trade that could be being shipped via, via Singapore. Um, and then there is the important consumption of wildlife, so both live and animal products. 
such as caged birds for the pet trade or saiga antelope fawn for TCM um, or shark fins. And there is increasing international momentum against illegal wildlife trade. So Singapore really has a very important role to play um, which, which you know, MPOX has shown that it's doing through implementing sound policies, uh, robust action, and, and strong leadership on the issue. Um, and uh, you know, uh, we've already heard from MPOX that, that the matter is taken very seriously here in Singapore, um, including a number of the interventions that um, that they are taking. So the next part of my presentation, uh, next slide, please. Um, will be to talk about some of the other approaches um, that are being taken, um, that WWF and other actors are taking, because you know, if we're going to tackle illegal wildlife trade, it requires a collaborative response, um, a coordinated approach between different stakeholders. Next slide, please. So a little bit about WWF Singapore. I mentioned that this is a key priority for our, for our organization. And we are committed to halting illegal wildlife trade and reducing the exploitation of wildlife in, in Southeast Asia. And there are three main approaches that uh, we are taking to this. Firstly, we're working to stop the exploitation and we're doing this by supporting the protection of wildlife, um, for example, through building enforcement and research capacity with our WWF partners in the region. Secondly, we're working to stop the trafficking and we do this by engaging businesses whose supply chains are at risk of uh, supporting illegal wildlife trade um, and working with governments, uh, for example, um, ministries uh, and such as NPARCs, by promoting policy dialogue, advocating for uh, you know, improvements and providing technical, technical advice for improvements to domestic policy frameworks um, uh, when called upon and providing our, our support for advocacy and, and outreach where we can. And then thirdly and finally, um, we're working to stop uh, the buying. And we can do this through promoting consumer awareness and through capacity within the local community to act as additional eyes on the ground to spot illegal wildlife trade in both physical and now increasingly online marketplaces. Next slide, please. So in terms of stopping exploitation, I'm just going to give a few examples of some of the regional projects that WWF Singapore is supporting. Next slide, please. So there, there are a range of projects that we, we support with our WWF partners um, from supporting ranger patrols on the ground and providing training to stop poaching and to monitor key wildlife habitats. Uh, technology, so uh, we are um, working with a number of, of partners such as the Smart Consortium, um, to develop conservation technology. And that's a real area in which Singapore can have quite a lot of prowess through the technical abilities here um, that can help um, not just monitoring on the ground, but also we can apply that more locally. We already heard about the fantastic forensics lab um, locally here in Singapore. And technology is really um, a field that is helping us keep pace with, with the, the speed of illegal wildlife trade and tackle it. Um, and then there are other actions that we take. So for example, we work in partnership with WF Malaysia on conservation actions on the ground, such as removing uh, uh, poaching snares or camera trapping to monitor tiger populations and, and, and poaching incidents. Next slide, please. Tackling illegal wildlife trade is also a key focus of our policy advocacy team at WF Singapore. Um, that could be through providing support, expertise, um, or advice and actionable solutions um, that we can do working together with the Singapore government and the stakeholders that uh, we all need to work with in order to implement and enforce things like the Endangered Species Act. Next slide, please. And uh, there are a number of ways that we're doing that. So from, from locally, uh, we, for example, can draw upon our network's technical expertise um, to provide feedback on the revision of the Endangered Species Act. Um, Renway mentioned that uh, we've been working obviously with NPARCs and others to build capacity, for example, by engaging the business sector on what they should be doing. Um, to, to enforce and support the Endangered Species Act and other requirements um, passed on by CITES. And, uh, um, you know, uh, and we've also been a very strong advocate as well for the ivory ban um, that we've heard, we've heard about, you know, from, from WS perspective, uh, this has been a really important step that Singapore has taken, sending a, a strong signal that uh, there, there is zero tolerance um, for the trade in ivory. Um, and it really helps underline the urgency of stopping illegal wildlife trade and really shows the, 
Singaporean government's resolve in, in combating LWT. So really important measure that um, WWF and other NGOs are very supportive of. More broadly in the region, uh, we're also involved in exercises such as helping support the development of a Tiger Recovery Action Plan that includes tackling issues like snaring. Um, and that goes into informed regional dialogues such as the Asian Ministerial Conference on Tiger Conservation. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. You might be having a technical error. Okay, um, so the next slide, uh, if you can catch up with me, there we go, great, uh, is, uh, is on business engagement, as you can see. And I mentioned earlier that um, wildlife traffickers are often taking advantage of the business supply chains and, and market platforms to trade in IWT. Uh, so it's very important that we have strong commitment from the private sector to prevent these platforms from being exploited by, by traders and traffickers. And uh, our market transformation team at Diverse Singapore has been continually engaging uh, with partners such as logistics companies, tech giants, and e-commerce e companies to help stop trafficking and buying. Next slide, please. So in particular, much illegal world of trade, and it seems to be a particular trend um, with the pandemic at the moment, has been moving online. And e-commerce has really blurred geographic boundaries, uh, which makes it much harder to track down and to prosecute sellers. So we've been part of a coalition with e-commerce companies to disrupt supply and to help deter one-off sellers. And um, perhaps if you just click one more. And so as part of that, I'm very pleased to say that Lazada, for example, has recently joined this coalition, being the first Singaporean um, e-commerce player to, to join onto this, this coalition. And really, it's about keeping up with the latest trends on online illegal wildlife trade um, across the e-commerce sector and drawing upon the strengths of um, NGOs in terms of understanding trends and patterns in order to disrupt uh, online trade. Next slide, please. Uh, we've already heard actually a little bit about um, what WWF and partners have been doing in terms of um, hosting webinars to engage e-commerce and tech players. Um, we do this via the coalition um, and through other means. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to finally talk about consumers. And, um, you know, consumers are also obviously a really uh, vital, vital part to this equation as well. I mentioned it's a more stakeholder approach. And uh, WWF conducted a consumer sentiment survey in Singapore to find out a bit more about Singaporean perceptions on IWT. And this information really helps um, us and our partners, including MPARTS, gain a better understanding on the scale of illegal wildlife trade locally, um, but also to inform what kind of actions and interventions we can take. Next slide, please. So I'm just gonna go through some of the findings and the study did produce some very interesting results. Uh, for example, we, we found that ivory products are the most commonly seen illegal wildlife product on sale which really, again, emphasizes the real importance of the ivory ban that's been brought in. Um, next slide, please. We also gained some um, insights from the survey on the types of IWT items that Singaporeans have seen on sale. Uh, generally, animal products were most commonly seen rather than live animals. Um, you see ivory, medicinal products, rhino, tiger park, and turtle shell being the most common. Next slide, please. One of uh, our most interesting observations, um, and I think this sometimes gets unsung and, and, and talk, unspoken, is that invertebrates and reptiles are very commonly seen for sale, um, rather than you know birds and mammals. Of course, you know we're, we're more familiarity with that. Um, so it really suggests a need to take a closer look at the sale of these particular uh, species. Next slide, please. And overall, the, the top three findings of, of that survey were that uh, many Singaporeans have encountered illegal wildlife trade online, um, but generally there is a low awareness on the legality of the products uh, that were encountered. But encouragingly, the vast majority um, uh, of those who were, were surveyed said that um, you know, they would boycott platforms um, if they found out that uh, products being sold were part of illegal wildlife trade. So it really infirm, import, it reaffirms the importance of consumers in part of this discussion. Next slide, please. Okay, so to empower the community to stop illegal wildlife trade, um, we've initiated the Cyber Spotter program. Next slide, please. And this is the final item I'll talk about. Um, and so this is a key citizen uh, science volunteer program that trains a select number of volunteers to identify and report illegal wildlife listings online. 
And those listings are then shared with our online coalition members and with NPARCs in order for us to understand and take further action. Next slide, please. And, uh, you know, we've only been running this since October 2020, but since then we've already had uh, over 100 volunteers trained and they have identified over 3,000 accurate listings uh, in nine different languages um, online and um, help us to identify things like new keywords that are being used uh, to trade and sell um, illegal wildlife trade products online. Next slide. Um, I won't dwell on this one, but just to say that uh, the focus areas are on Appendix 1 and 2 of, of CITES here that, that uh, Renway outlined a bit about at the beginning. Um, but it really highlights some of, the, some of the diversity of products that we're finding online in Asia Pacific. Next slide. And um, really some of the unique findings for Asia Pacific. Um, so better understanding locally of some of the trends uh, is very important. And then next slide, please. And there are a number of actions that you and I can take as consumers as well. So in terms of making informed decisions when buying online, um, checking the provenance of items that you're purchasing, the CITES um, license and regulations um, associated with it, helping raise awareness with others. And if you're very interested, then you know you can, you can join the CyberSpotter program. You can find out details on WWF's website. Okay, next slide, which is my last slide, um, is really just to summarize that um, I hope it's come across that illegal wildlife trade really does threaten the well-being of nature and society, um, that our geographic location here in Singapore and our role as a transport and transit hub means that we are a key player here, but we also have a huge role that we can play in halting illegal wildlife trade, and that there are a lot of actions that can be taken through collaborative efforts between stakeholders, including um, by consumers, including myself and you, um, to make informed decisions to stem uh, the demand for illegal wildlife trade. Thank you. I'll end there. Thank you speakers for sharing about Singapore's efforts in combating illegal wildlife trade and the important work done behind the scenes to keep wildlife and livelihoods safe. Uh, I particularly appreciate that just the complexities of this system and the different moving parts in it, and how yeah, many different players are working together to combat this. So now it's time for our Q&A session. Uh, thank you to everyone in the audience who submitted questions, uh, be it beforehand or during the session. And we'll try our best to answer as many questions as you can during this Q&A. So on to the first question. Yeah, how does the Center for Wildlife Forensics contribute to combating legal wildlife trade? And how long does it take uh, from sampling to obtaining the results? So I'll get uh, Dr. Hyung to answer this question. Hey, the Center for Wildlife Forensics uses science and technology to investigate wildlife illegal trades. So uh, the laboratory actually performed all the analysis and then we actually share all this information uh, to the enforcement and the policy units so that appropriate actions can be taken. Um, regarding the duration, it really depends very much on the uh, magnitude of the seizure uh, and uh, it typically can be as fast uh, as a week to several months. So um, this, this is a, a bit harder to, to answer because it really depends on uh, the scale and the type of samples that we receive. Thank you, Dr. Hyung. Uh, on to the next question. What happens when the government catches a member of the public illegally selling or purchasing a species? So I'll get uh, Renhui to answer this question. Hi, thanks, Nicholas. Okay, so like I shared earlier on, um, if it's a sighted species, then it's covered under the Endangered Species Act. So it entails a fine of uh, if it's illegally imported, uh, you know, and then sold publicly uh, for illegal import, then there will it entails a fine of 50,000 after a maximum aggregate of 500,000 um, and jail term and all two years. Um, and specifically if, you know, uh, domestically we have, like I mentioned, the ivory ban, uh, so fines and jail term will also entail. If it's outside the CITES species, then it will be covered under the Wildlife Act la, and the necessary penalties will follow as well. La under the Wildlife Act for non sighty species, yeah. Thank you, Renhui. All right, let's move to the third question. The penalties for illegal wildlife trade under the ESA, that's the Endangered Species Act, 
they are proposed to be increased significantly. Is this justified? Okay, so I'll get Renhui to uh, chime in on this again. Oh no, it's my turn. Okay. Okay, thanks, Nicholas. So, um, yes, so part of our review, we consulted the different stakeholders and then we also benchmark and compare our legislation domestically to ensure it's, it has legal parity and also to look at regional uh, legislation as well. Importantly, we opened up our public consultation recently. So we've gotten our stake, um, or rather we have gotten feedback and inputs on the legislation or the penalties uh, on the proposed uh, amendments to the legislation. So all this will be taken into consideration and to ensure that it's all justified lah, when eventually we roll out the new act. Mm. Thank you, Renhui. Uh, so next question, what is Singapore's law enforcement able to do now in order to deal with these perpetrators, both from external countries and also residents who trap wildlife for income at our forest reserves? can ask Renway again first to uh, respond. Okay, so um, if the offence is committed within Singapore, the legislation or the penalties uh, will apply to, you know, to the offender, like, regardless, is it a local resident or a foreigner? So um, if wildlife is being entrapped uh, in our forest reserve, then uh, it will be an offence under the Wildlife Act and then uh, it can lead to uh, fines and jail term la, under the Wildlife Act. Yeah. And uh, sorry, just to add, right? So if it happens in uh, protected areas like our nature reserve, then we actually have our Parks and Trees Act, uh, whereby because it's inside a protect, protected reserve, then it actually entails a fine of 50000 and jail term of six months under the PTA, la, the plants. Uh, the Parks and Trees Act, yeah. Thank you, Renhui. All right, we have a next question. Uh, what is NPARC's position on the import of songbirds? Uh, I'm going to ask my colleague Renhui to weigh in again on this. Yes, thank you, Renhui. Okay, so um, I think during my presentation, I broadly shared that uh, Singapore is a signatory to CITES. And then uh, Singapore also signed on to the various uh, international treaties uh, uh, and we are a member of WTO. So the regulations of songbirds uh, is very closely monitored and the paperwork and uh, it's aligned to international obligation such that when there is import of songbirds, we will check with the source country to ensure that the export from the source country uh, it's sustainable and legal with the necessary paperwork. And on top of that, uh, the birds needs to come from bird-free zone. Uh, this is especially important uh, in terms of uh, ensuring uh, animal health and uh, preventing any disease outbreak uh, in the case of like illegal import. So I think in, in short, basically um, our position is aligned to international uh, conventions and it is to support the sustainable and legal trade of import of songbirds um, and as well as any other species la, of animal to ensure that their survival are not threatened la, by the trade itself. Hmm. Thanks, Renhui, again. All right, next question. Uh, can more recognition and support be given towards legal wildlife trade, be it with regard to CITES or non CITES species? Uh, support for globally legitimate wildlife trade is a critical part in countering uh, illegal wildlife trade. Uh, we'll get uh, colleagues both from NPARCS and uh, WRUF to uh, comment on this. Maybe I'll jump in to spare Renway who's had to uh, answer most of the questions. Um, actually, I think this is a really important question and I'm, I'm very glad that it's been raised. Uh, so yes, uh, I would say that WF would say that um, we should be paying um, a lot of attention to legal wildlife trade. Uh, we mentioned CITES, and I think there's some 37,000 species listed on CITES, but CITES is constantly being updated, and we have to keep pace um, with really what we're seeing um, uh, in terms of, of demand for, uh, for wildlife trade that isn't listed. Uh, and so, um, yes, there are actions and measures that can be taken um, off the top of, the off, off of my head. Um, one would be, for example, looking at better regulation within the pet trade, 
um, better traceability of where species are coming from that are legally traded. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I'm really glad that someone brought up brought up the, the, the this point because it is an important one to bear in mind. Thank you. Okay, hey, thanks, Liz. Um, okay, so just to chime in here, um, it's really like I mentioned, um, the international trade is governed by international treaty. And during my presentation, I shared about uh, CITES, which is the main instrument. Uh, um, as long as, and it's a proper system whereby, uh, as long as there are proper documentation permits backed by a permit system, um, then legal trade can happen as it is uh, legally and sustainably. Um, and I think what I didn't mention is really every three years there were a meeting, there'll be a meeting to uplist and to decide whether new species needs to be uh, have tightened regulation or requiring paperwork. So over during at that meeting, uh, it will be with inputs of like science uh, research, uh, science-based input and research of whether more species needs to be protected um, and whether red trade needs to be regulated further. So I think as much as possible, there is recognition uh, and support for legal trade. And like I mentioned in my uh, presentation earlier on, um, it's not just about illegal trade. The first portion I described about no legal trade and how do we make it, how do we make sure that trade can happen and why legal trade is important in terms of giving livelihood, uh, ensuring that protecting our biodiversity. Uh, yeah, so, so I think, yeah, good question and definitely something that uh, is being recognized and support is being given. Yep, thank you both Elizabeth and Renhui. Uh, we now come to our final question. So how can the public support the fight against the illegal trade in wildlife? Uh, maybe I'll get uh, Elizabeth to uh, respond first before Renhui. Thank you for uh, asking this question. So I touched on it briefly in my, my presentation. Um, some of the ways in which uh, the public can work is in terms of, um, first of just making more informed decisions when buying things online and in person um, and not contributing to the overall demand for legal work and trade. And appreciate that that actually can be very difficult. I mentioned 37,000 species listed on CITES. So, um, you know, uh, the best thing you can do is, is um, question when you're buying products online, double check. There's a lot of information available online. Even a quick Google search will tell you if that animal is endangered or if it's CITES listed. Um, and you should always be checking for whether or not a valid CITES permit has been issued for a product that is implicated. Um, and I think we mentioned raising awareness. That really is quite key. Um, speak to your friends, speak to your family about the issue. A lot of people don't realize just quite the crisis um, that illegal wildlife trade and wildlife trade is placing. Um, on, on the planet um, and the, the, the services that the planet provides um, to us. Um, so, you know, do look on WWF Singapore's website if you want to find out more. We do actually have some information on that that can guide you, um, including, again, mentioning Cyber Spotters program if you want to try your hand at being an online detective. Hmm. Yeah, very much agree with Elizabeth. Um, I think if you're unsure, then don't buy. If you want to buy, make informed decision. Um, and I think everyone here is definitely very interested in the topic. So if you want to contribute more, please sign up to be our ambassador. Um, like I shared earlier on uh, the link, you can go to uh, yeah, go.gov.sg slash ESA. Uh, you'll find out more about the work that we are doing, um, as well as the amendments that we are doing to the legislation. Contribute your ideas, contribute, uh, you know, work together with us to combat this, because I think uh, very importantly, at the end of the day, it's definitely not something that a uh, regulator can do. It has to be a collective effort, a concerted effort from all different parties along the supply chain, uh, the regulators, the businesses, the NGOs, uh, as well as important, the consumer where the demand uh, actually goes to, um, you know, uh, play a part together uh, to stop this, uh, to address the issue that we have at hand. So, yeah. Thank you both, Elizabeth and Renhui. Yes, uh, we received quite a number of questions uh, near the end of the webinar, but unfortunately, we're not able to answer all of them due to time constraints. Uh, 
Uh, but as Renhui mentioned earlier, uh, if you want to continue to share your thoughts with us, you can scan the QR code on the slide right now to uh, just uh, start and um, you know, take part in the public consultation that we are having uh, with regard to the proposed amendments to the ESA. So yes, uh, with that, I'd like to thank all the speakers again for taking the time off this Saturday morning to uh, you know, just talk to us about and just keep us better informed about illegal wildlife trade. Uh, also, a big thank you to our audience on Zoom here as well on YouTube uh, for joining us this morning. Uh, thanks to all for attending this session and have a great day ahead.